So I'm looking forward to discussing what we can learn from superheroes about ourselves, our fears, and our aspirations. And I'm just tremendously pleased to have with the, us here today Douglas Wolfe, whose wonderful book I've already mentioned. I highly recommend it for anyone who's interested in learning more about comics and graphic novels. Um, and who also writes about comics for Time Magazine, The New York Times, and Rolling Stone. All the way over on the left, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, a senior editor at The Atlantic, whose comics-infused memoir of growing up in Baltimore, The Beautiful Struggle, is one of my favorite books. And right here to my left, um, Zach Stentz, the screenwriter behind two of this summer's biggest superhero blockbusters, uh, X-Men First Class and Thor. So I'm tremendously pleased to have them here with us today. Um, and I wanted to start out by asking, because you know, there's this common conception that superhero stories are children's stories. But all of us have continued to write about and think about, and in some cases produce superhero stories well into adulthood. So I was curious what your introductions to the genre were. What, what, who was your first superhero? Oh, um, I just want to say, uh, first of all, I'm amazed to be sitting here. Since you're taking me back to childhood, if you'd have told me when I was seven or eight years old that there would be a <laughs> political conference where you would sit up and talk about Superman and Spider-Man. <laughs> The very fact that they're making movies about this was that, you know, we actually are having a political conference and a political conversation about the import <coughs> of s the web s uh, swinger, web swinger. <laughs> um, probably like everybody else, you know, Spider-Man, Superman, that sort of thing. But uh, the first comic book I really got into was X-Men. And uh, I think in terms of mass popular culture, uh, at that point in the mid 80s, it was in my life the greatest example of diversity that I'd really ever seen. I mean, these guys were from everywhere, you know, had all sorts of personalities. And, you know, being a young black kid in Baltimore, I just absolutely fell in love with Storm. Um, to not only have, you know, an, a, a black woman, not even an African American woman, an African woman, like, my God, they're really taking it back. <laughs> and to have her, like, you know, super empowered, I mean, just totally, totally. Uh, completely blew my mind. And so um, I think for me, comic books, in contrast, again, to the rest of mass uh, popular culture at that point in time, uh, really struck me as particularly inclusive. I don't know how accurate a judgment that was. Uh, but you know, at, at a very young age, that really attracted me. Uh, my first superhero was actually one of my own creation <laughs> when I was uh, six and seven years old, I spent the better part of a year wearing a leopard <laughs> costume that I asked my mom to make me with a tail on the back and a cape and insisted that everyone from my parents to friends to teachers address me only not as Zach but as Super Cat. <laughs> 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 and you make a living from it now, it's great. And <laughs> now Super Cat keeps the lights on, so <laughs> I, I, I like to call the last 10 years of my life Revenge of Super Cat. <laughs> that's, that's I can't beat that. Uh, what, uh, what my introduction to superheroes has been, I'd, I'd say that there have been a couple of different waves of introduction because I've understood them differently at different points in my life. You know. Eight-year-old Douglas uh, trying to kill some time when he's spending time with his grandparents goes to the newsstand and gets an issue of Green Lantern and is like, wow, this is really cool. He can do lots of different things. Uh, 17 or 18-year-old Douglas reading Watchmen thinks like, whoa, this is actually a story about the way that nuclear fear has affected the evolution of the American experience. And that's kind of fantastic. And you know now, like forty-one-year-old Douglas, like goes to the comic store every Wednesday. Still, I'm like, oh my God, new issue of Batwoman. This is just an amazing you know, meditation on "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." Like, <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, I was also a huge X-Men fan growing up. Um, my and I think one of the reasons that I think about superheroes so broadly is that my cousin was an insane comics card collector. And so my introduction was effectively reading all of these character biographies and realizing, oh my gosh, Ghost Rider, this guy who rides around on a motorcycle with a flaming skull, uh, represents the American West and vigilante justice. Uh, that uh, Rogue, a member of the X-Men who uh, has unfortunate effects on anyone she touches, represents adolescent isolation. So I got this huge blast 
Um, and it's interesting to me to see which superhero stories have sort of risen to the top or are relevant at any given moment. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is why of the two sort of originary superheroes, Batman and Superman, Batman seems so much more resonant right now. We've had you know, Christopher Nolan's wonderful movies um, which have explored really the dark side of, uh, of power and of trying to lock down an, uh, sort of uncontrollable situations. I'm curious, does Batman represent a sort of triumph of fear over hope and over optimism in sort of the way that we've told stories about him recently? I think it's really tempting to uh, it, it's really tempting to go into the whole sociological analysis and say uh, you know Batman is the uh, the ultimate hero for the age of Reagan ki kind of thing, <laughs> but I, I'm a little hesitant to go there just because I think that if you look at the history of those two characters and their popularity, a lot of it is based on the aesthetic merits of uh, mm -hmm. whatever was most dominant at the time. If you had asked someone in the mid eight, you know, if you'd asked someone in the early 80s which was more popular, it would be Superman because people still had fond memories of the Christopher Reeve, Richard Donner movies. And Batman was the campy show with Biff, Pow, Adam West. Um, I think those, you know, as the, as the Superman franchise degenerated and then the Tim Burton Batman just kind of became amazingly popular, I think you, you had a reversal of those two things, but um, maybe someone else will go out on that limb, but I'm not, I'm not quite ready to go there. It's, you know, it's a good question. That's a very, very good point. And the, what the characters mean is, in a lot of ways, secondarily, secondary to how they're done, how they're treated, what, what the aesthetic impact of the work itself is. Uh, you know, Superman is still part of the national conversation. Maybe people, there are not particular Superman stories at the moment that people respond to the way they respond to The Dark Knight, but maybe that's because there, there haven't been stories like that made. On the other hand, you know, the idea of Superman is still very much kicking around. People watch, you know, how many seasons of Smallville. Uh, I think you know, part of that is actually that Superman's opposite number, Lex Luthor, the billionaire who feels absolutely entitled to everything. Uh, you know, he, that's a great villain for the moment. That's that's how his, how he was reinvented in the mid '80s as not not an inventor, not a genius, not just a guy with a grudge against Superman, but somebody of the super privileged class who believes he always deserves more. Mm. Well, I was curious about that because Grant Morrison, who I quoted earlier, is drawing a new su uh, Superman story that tries to bring the character back to his fairly populist roots. And I was curious as to whether you thought that would be effective. Is there because superhero stories often sort of stop short of being truly revolutionary, of calling for a real upheaval in the social order. One of the reasons we like Batman is because he's a benevolent, extremely rich person. He is someone with, someone with a lot of money who uses it to buy t buy toys that he then goes out and beats people up with. Um, and so I was I'm curious as to whether there's room for you know a Superman who kind of represents the 99% movement. Yeah, I think um, I'm gonna lean to what. Well, it's funny when you asked the uh, last question before about which uh, why Batman was more popular than Superman. I just wanted to make sure Zach hadn't had a hand in the last <laughs> Superman movie <laughs> before I answered that question. But I think he's dead on. I I, I really think you can tell any story uh, if it's a good story. You know, I think had that film been considerably better, uh, and had they not had kryptonite in the film, for <laughs> instance, uh, I think we might be having a very different conversation now. Mm. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I just wonder how much. I mean, I'm sure there's some relationship between politics and popularity, you know. But to you know, reach into another field is always this sort of temptation to do this with hip hop and say, well, Public Enemy was popular and N.W.A. was, you know, what happened? Did something change with the people? But maybe. Public Enemy just made better records at that point, and then NWA <laughs> made better records later. Like that could be <coughs> actually what's going on. So I, I, I just I, I wonder about that. Yeah, though the there is. I, I mean, speaking of Grant Morrison, he has that great quote um, comparing the two characters, where he says, uh, "Batman has a butler and Superman has a boss." <laughs> um, 
which is, uh, I, I thought, a very succinct way of, uh, of, of talking about those two different places where those characters are coming from. Mm. Well, it would be interesting to see if there's a shift from sort of external to uh, sort of more domestic concerns. Obviously, The Dark Knight, the second Chris Nolan Batman movie, is to a certain extent a domestic story. Batman, against the, against the advice of his advisors, uh, decides to use what's effectively warrantless wiretapping to get a sense of what's happening in Gotham and to track down the Joker. But it's also very much a movie about security concerns. And I wonder if we could have a Superman that's more about, about that sort of butler boss uh, conundrum. It'll be interesting to see what happens. You don't hold out too much hope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, Zack, if you want to tell us a little bit more about Zack Snyder, who is making the next <laughs> Superman movie, it might give us a sense of what oh, to I look didn't out for. Really. Yeah, yes. Zach, um, he's a very talented director, but I wouldn't go looking for a lot of political <laughs> subtext there. Or at least not subtle political not subtext. Not subtle, yeah. <laughs> we can have a conversation about that later. Well, I wanted to shift uh, the conversation a little bit to uh, a superhero team that clearly has a lot of resonance for everyone here, the X-Men. Um, because... Uh, X-Men First Class, which uh, Zach and his writing partner wrote, um, is a period piece. It goes back in time to you know, an age when the conflict was simpler. It's the US versus the Soviet Union with mutants lined up on either side. Um, and for me, I thought the movie, which is largely concerned with the question of whether it makes sense for mutants to assimilate or whether they should effectively form a separate society, was a very powerful metaphor for gay rights. And I'd be curious to hear you talk a little bit more about how that movie came together and sort of how that theme came to the forefront. Um, you know, if a for anyone who's seen the other movies or followed the X-Men uh, at all, the X-Men, as, as people have said, have been a very powerful allegory since, since their inception. And I think going back to the beginning, it was much more about being a teenager and the kind of universal uh, feelings of outsiderdom, but but pretty quickly, um, it a lot of a lot of the writers for it and a lot of the fans started picking up a civil rights a civil rights subtext. And I know in the uh, in the first movie, uh, the director Brian Singer and the writers that he worked with were were very explicitly with the two car the two uh, opposing mutants. Uh, Professor X and Magneto going for a Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm X dichotomy to the to the extent that they even have uh, Magneto at the end of the movie say by any means necessary, um, you know, in case people were missing, in case people had missed <laughs> that. Hint, hint. Um, hint, hint um, wink, wink. Um, and it's just you know, and when we were working with Brian on the, my partner and I were working on this on the script, um, you know, I think. Brian's own experience as a uh, gay man growing up in New Jersey in the in the 70s and 80s, I think, definitely informed kind of how those characters resonated to him, and we tried to kind of honor the we tried to honor the spirit of that as as much as we could, and and you know that it's it's there there are many layers there you know there's the the civil rights the civil rights layer there's the Cold War layer there's the the gay rights layer, and there's you know a lot of people picked up on the the kind of post Holocaust Jewish identity layer. Um, that was I, I know uh, John Podhoritz got very very angry at uh, us putting the line uh, never again, in, it, in the uh, mouth of a particular character at the end of that movie. But that was you know that was by design, and it was you know I, I think a big part of the outrage among some people is the idea that superhero comics and movies are somehow a lesser or unworthy art form to wrestle with, uh, to, re to use to wrestle with real world issues. And obviously I kind of reject that. I think that, I think that it's, a, I, I think if anything, the rise of the superhero movie, you, that you can make judgments about the rise of the superhero movie in the last 10 years, I think it's no coincidence that as our political discourse has gotten increasingly frightened and and circumscribed in, in a lot of ways that you're seeing a lot of these concerns and what's going on in the culture coming out coming out in the movies and I think a hundred years from now 
people are going to look at the kind of 11 years of superhero movies from 2000 to 2011 and see them as a real document of where America as a country was at that point. I want to come back to that, but um, Tanahazi, you wrote a wonderful column for the New York Times about your reactions to first class. And I'd be curious. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you could, yeah, go, go, go ahead. I'd be curious to hear you <laughs> sort of talk about that reaction a little bit more, especially because the column for me was an example of both the interesting ways that the X-Men can stand in for a lot of different social movements but also for the ways that they can put those movements sort of in, you know, in juxtaposition with each other. Um, and the sort of fight for space in these kinds of conversations. Right. Well, um, the first thing I should say is I, I, I really enjoyed the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Very important that I say that. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually not just saying that. I really did enjoy <laughs> the movie. And the funny thing is me and Zach had actually been email, in email dialogue um, after I uh, blogged about somebody that slammed one of his other movies. <laughs> and he said, you need to take your kid to see this. So I took my kid to see it, and I did actually like it, and then I went to see X-Men First Class and wrote about that. I didn't realize, I wasn't paying attention to the credits. And I didn't realize the same guy wrote it, and I was going to slam the film again. Um, so incredibly, incredibly awkward to get yet another email from Zach. It was a nice one. Zach's a, a really kind guy, so it wasn't like a bad thing. I'm, I'm playing it up here. Uh, to get to the actual point, um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'll go to see this movie. I took my son to see it. I uh, allowed him to skip school that day. Uh, we were going to have a great day. Uh, it's something to be an X-Men fan and then to have your kid be a fan of the same thing, something you bond over. Uh, so we went to have this really, really beautiful experience. And it was, and we were chugging along about halfway through. And I think everybody, I, I can do spoilers now. <laughs> it's okay. Right? Spoilers are fine. Uh, the only African-American well, I guess not the only, but one of the two African, the only, only mutant who dies is an African American. Don't forget, the other one goes evil. And the other one goes <laughs> evil. So, <laughs> here you are, and so at the end of the movie, what you end up with, as everybody knows, that's, that's the oldest cliche in the book, but at the end of the movie, you end up with a situation where the uh, champions of diversity and democracy and justice in 1962, no less, as I wrote in the, in the column, are a team full of white guys. I mean, literally guys, like actually, <laughs> white guys at the end, you know, sort of standing there. Um, and so it was this weird experience of having technically really enjoyed what I just saw. And at the same moment, feeling like I was standing outside of it. And if I could just push that last point uh, a bit for a second, I don't really believe that the X-Men or any movie uh, has to, you know, address me or address every community or anything like that. Uh, there's often this conversation about, say, Mad Men, about, well, well should there be, be more black people on Mad Men? I always say, no, there shouldn't. Mad Men's fine. But what you want is some sort of, for a period of peace, is some sort of, uh, what I would want, is some sort of awareness of the moment. 1962, which is the year uh, X-Men First Class is set in, um, is not just the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's also the year that George Wallace uh, is elected governor in Alabama. <coughs> it's the year that uh, James Meredith, goes to integrate the uh, University of Mississippi, and there's basically a riot down there, and they have to call in federal soldiers. Uh, it's the, uh, I wanna say, I hope I'm getting this right, I really should know this, but I really believe it's the 100th anniversary of Lincoln deciding he's gonna issue the Emancipation Proclamation. I think it actually comes out in 1863. But it's a momentous capstone if you consider the past 100 years and the Civil War as an ongoing struggle for all these values that we're sitting here talking about Today, democracy, egalitarianism, individual rights, it's an it's a incredible, incredible moment, not just for African Americans, but for many of the advances in Western philosophy and Western thought, period. And to see it absent from the movie, <laughs> then to see like the African Americans in the movie completely dispatched, it was just like, wow, wow. It just didn't seem to have the kind of awareness that I wanted, and I thought it actually got to a particular thing that I think and maybe not just African Americans, but you know anybody who's ever felt on the outside of any aspect of the American experience feels where you have this odd moment of admiring something from a distance and considering it beautiful, and yet feeling like at the same time it has no place for you. I hope that was gentle. <laughs> I really do. I try, to be, try to be as gentle as possible. Without, yeah, we, we won't get into the behind the scenes things that, uh, <laughs> that, that went on, but I think that's a very fair and uh, that's a, a very fair, fair and accurate summation of, uh, of, of 
the way that that yeah it didn't it it if if I could if I had my druthers and and they shot the version that uh, I would be a hundred percent happy with I would have liked to have seen more engagement with the civil rights movement we tried to do a little nod towards it with the moment where they're uh, where they're sitting on the where uh, the two characters are uh, are playing chess in front of the Lincoln Memorial right. as a uh, as a as a little tip of the hat to the uh, to the to the March on Washington, but right. uh, it would have been it would have been nice had we done that and had they not decided to kill the black guy on page sixty. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a follow up question? Absolutely. About that? I just I'm curious. Does this happen uh, as a, you know you're a screenwriter, and I don't even necessarily mean with this issue, but in general you write a script, you envision it coming a certain way, and then people go after the movie. Your name's on it, but you're not really, you don't have complete power. It's not like writing a book, you know, where you're actually responsible for everything. That's cor that is very correct. There, there are many cooks and there are many cooks in the kitchen of a, uh, of a, of a big Hollywood movie, but I kind of feel like if my name's on it, I need to stand behind it to one, to one degree or another. I'm not going to defend every, I'm not going to defend everything because I don't agree with, with everything, but it's, you know, it's like, that's, that's my name and, and Planting, planting my flag. <laughs> so, but yes, you're right. And I think all of this raises an interesting question that I wanted to ask you about since you've looked at comics, I think, in a really comprehensive and interesting way. One of the challenges for not just first class, but for superhero stories generally, is who they represent and who is included in these conversations about power and how to use it responsibly and what it means to be powerful. And one of the groups that is systematically excluded or presented in troubling ways is women. Um, and this has become and refrigerators, even. Yes. I mean, there is there is literally a blog called Women in Refrigerators that is depictions of women being brutally murdered in superhero comics. Um, there, you know, there was a recent controversy. One of the two big comics lines, yeah. DC, recently relaunched um, all of its signature superhero stories with the promise that they would be accessible and interesting to new audiences. And that has not gone so well, am I right? Yes and no. I mean, it's apparently sold pretty well, but it's been pointed out, number one, the ways that they represent women are range from like, okay to, oh my God, why? Uh, <laughs> and you know, the involvement of women on the creative side is, went from like an embarrassingly small percentage to a really, really, really embarrassingly small percentage. And as somebody who's engaged with this culture, you know, this, this is an embarrassment for all of us. Uh, and nobody's entirely sure why it is. That's, that's said, you know, a lot of it has to do with the kind of increasing maleness of mainstream superhero comics mm -hmm. over the last 20 or 30, 40 years. It's starting to blow up again. It's starting to open up again, but it's not anywhere near as far as I and a lot of other people would like. But the really interesting thing about all of this is that there's been enormous reaction to all of this online. And one really interesting thing about comic books is that the pe th they're not just like, here's the cultural artifact that's produced and then it's out in the world. It's very much a conversation between the people who make them and the people who read them and enjoy them and, and obsess over them and go to conventions for them. Do you think that goes all the way back to the letters columns in the old it could, ones? Um, it had its start there, but now you know, fan culture is gigantic. You know, if you go to the Comic-Con International in San Diego, even just 10 years ago, it was you know, 40,000 people or so. Now it's 135,000 people and it sell, sells out in 10 minutes, so who knows how many people mm -hmm. would come if they could all come. Uh, but there's this enormous reaction to stuff online, there's this enormous reaction to stuff in person, and when this stuff started happening, a lot of people reacted very strongly and said, that this is really not okay. I'm ostensibly the target audience for this, and this is not okay with me. And we're starting to see a reaction from the people who make the mainstream comics, like, yeah, okay, we hear you. We're mm -hmm. gonna try to do something about this. We might not be exactly sure where to start, but yeah, we, yeah. But we it's, an, I mean, it's yeah. an interesting question because, um, I mean, clearly getting better representation and better stories about women in comics has been a concern for a long time. Yeah. And the success has been so inconsistent and easy to, to erode. Right. And is that simply a self-perpetuating cycle? I mean, I don't like the idea that the core comic fandom is terrified of women in power, yeah. but, you know, there, 
when DC's decision to revamp uh, one of its female superheroes turns her into essentially a brain dead sex kitten. It's hard to believe that right. there isn't a strain of that. Or, in that, that <laughs> or that somebody along the command chain didn't say, like, actually, this is a really bad idea. Could you go back and rethink that? Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, yeah. I mean, does that speak to some sort of larger fears we have about the empowerment of women, the empowerment of black people? I mean, are these, isn't you know. Isn't it so like, uh, I mean, if you, if you, again, if you broaden this out a little bit, I think there's a through line that runs from comic books through hip hop into video games. And somebody you know, with more knowledge than me might throw metal in there. I've, I've often heard the same thing. And so I just, the point you made about maleness really, really struck me. And one of the most depressing things about the whole women piece in comic books, and I guess for me personally in hip hop too, is as you grow older as a male, <laughs> um, it doesn't even fit your image of masculinity yeah. anymore. There's something almost unmacho yeah. <laughs> about it. You know, like it doesn't really fit. And so I end up having to, I, you know, this is one of the big reasons why I put, you know, some distance between myself and comic books because some of the stuff you just like, well, I'm not like 13 anymore. Right. When, um, when, when it's just dudes talking to dudes about stuff that dudes think is important, which is dudes, <laughs> um, you know, uh, eventually you get to a point where like, as a guy, I'm like, I can't even deal with this anymore. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's an interesting conversation. And to go back to the question of period pieces, one of the other, and sort of representation there, it was interesting to me to see this summer's uh, Captain America, the first Avenger movie, um, which actually took pains to show Captain America, who is the superhero who perhaps most directly exemplifies American power since his name is Captain America and he wears the stars and stripes. They made a real effort to have him working with an integrated team, despite the fact that the armed forces weren't integrated at the time when the story was taking place. And I was curious, I mean, does that sort of go back to the Mad Men question? You know, what, what should we be shooting for in terms of superhero diversity? Which I think is a really, I mean, what should the goals be? Should it be that we have 50% of superheroes are women, that you know, the representation breaks down along lines of sexual orientation and ethnicity. What would an ideal comics world look like for telling the kinds of stories that comics can somehow uniquely tell? I mean, what, one of the issues that you deal with, um, whether it's comic book movies or comic books in general, is that most of the really beloved characters have these huge long histories and continuities going back 70 years or more in some cases. So, and a lot of, a big chunk of the fan base gets very upset when you start changing one thread of the costume, much less thinking about changing the race of the gender of, right. of, so, of, one of, the, of one of the characters. So you are kind of, kind of pushed and pulled often as a creator between wanting to reflect the America that exists now and hopefully the America that will exist going forward demographically and otherwise, and the fact that you're, you're playing with these characters who in a lot of cases represent the America of 1962 or represent the America of 1938 or a couple of white guys in Brooklyn's idea of, of the America of 1938. So it's a, there, there's a tension there that's, that's not always easy to resolve. What? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I'm gonna go into full pundit mode. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, because I haven't seen the film, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway. Um, so I'm gonna be official here. I, <coughs> nevertheless, the conflict you raised, I think is, 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 is a question that doesn't just come up in comic books. It comes up in period pieces. Uh, in general, we love talking about our past, our myths, et cetera. Um, to present things as they were uh, can be a little jarring and a little disturbing. Um, I think at this point, like a show like Mad Men has certain luxuries that it can take and it can, you know, it has earned a, a kind of freedom. Um, that I wonder uh, if a big budget mass market movie like Captain America really, really has. From a strict perspective of storytelling, uh, you know, box office stuff aside, um, you can do it. I mean, you can confront. It's not impossible to confront history. I mean, people in comic books do it actually. They can, you know what I mean? I've definitely seen stories where people confronted history. There's that whole thing about, you know, the Captain America art 
where they do this sort of combination with the T Tuskegee experiment and the original Captain America, this guy that got experimented on and all that. So there are ways of definitely confronting history. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it pays or how much incentive uh, there I mean, is for e it. Even in a really minor way, when, when we were working on X-Men First Class and we knew it was going to be set in 1962, we had a character who in the comic books is a scientist, Moira McTaggart, is our female CIA operative who's, who is the liaison, right. is the CIA's liaison. Right. And we were, as writers, we were really insistent that, you know what, she has to be facing sexism. Right. Um, the right. fact that she's a woman in the CIA in 1962, you can't just treat it like it's 2000. I mean, I'm sure there's probably sexism in the CIA now to some do degree or another, <laughs> one would imagine. Um, but certainly in 1962, not only is that something that has to be dealt with, but it's something that could be resonant from a storytelling perspective because, hey, maybe she feels a kinship to these mutants because, in a way, she is an outsider herself as a, as a woman in the CIA. Not all of that made it to the screen. Little bits and pieces did, more in deleted scenes, um, <laughs> as is so often the case. But it's but it is something that we it is something that we are conscious of and trying to trying to engage with that that y you have to you know you have to at least make nods towards what the what the period what the period was. And I will actually add, just from a purely commercial capitalist perspective, if you're making any kind of mass culture art, you want as few people as possible to find themselves excluded from that art, especially if they're part of your potential audience. You know, but, uh, that's to, to exclude a big chunk of your potential audience is a failure of a failure of art, a failure of craft. Mm. But Douglas, wouldn't you wouldn't you say that um, if you are to confront the United States Army as it was at that point in time, you may actually be excluding part of your audience that doesn't want to go to Captain America? And also, that. also the case. Yeah. It's yeah. A, it's a challenge, but I think we've seen. Yeah, I liked Captain America a lot, but I I, I don't think it would have been difficult to even show that the you know the howling commandos the the unit that uh, that or you know to show that the unit that he is in is different from the rest of the is different from the rest of the army and more right. progressive or or, or whatever right. just, just address the issue right. like make make it clear that you know what's going on you're addressing what's in your audience's mind well and i wanted to go back to the point that we've been sort of discussing around the edges here which is that Comics and superhero fandom are incredibly powerful. These are people who spend a lot of money, who are extremely passionate, who arrange their leisure time around, um, around this form of art that they care a lot about. But that passion can also become sort of a wedge against progress. The idea that, you know, Spider-Man has always been a white guy, so it's a big deal to have a mixed race teenager from New York put on the mask. Um, and I'm curious, you know, as to how flexible you think superhero fans are and what it means when something when a company like DC does try to make its characters more representative as they did with the introduction of this new um, biracial Spider-Man. Right. Um, I will actually add that uh, I think I was telling you yes. yesterday, the new biracial Spider-Man who was making headlines and people were getting all head up about about. Glenn Beck is very yeah, upset about so. biracial Spider-Man. <laughs> the second biracial Spider-Man. Like, 20 years ago, there was another one, Miguel O'Hara. Uh, <laughs> but uh, th there's, I imagine that there is a very loud um, and aging and irritable minority who gets really upset when anything changes at all. But on the other hand, I, I was, you know, I was a little disappointed that the Green Lantern in the Green Lantern movie was like the Hal Jordan character, the white guy. Like every kid in America who's watched the Justice League TV series thinks. Green Lantern is John Stewart, like the black guy who's not the Daily Show host. Not the Daily, not, not the Daily Show host. Yes. As um, interesting as that would be, um, I I don't understand why that decision was made. It, I, I think it would have been a much more interesting decision. But I don't know. Um, yeah, when we, when we did Thor um, this summer, there was a minor outcry um, about making uh, Heimdall. One of the uh, the Norse god slash aliens uh, um, into I was going to say African American, but he was <laughs> played by uh, played by a uh, an awesome uh, an awesome British actor named Idris Elba. Um, but the interesting thing is, while I think there is a a very strong strain of small C conservatism among uh, comic book fans, 
I like to think that quality wins, that, that yeah. quality generally wins the argument with them. Right. And it's Idris frickin' Elba, man. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. you know, when you, when you, when they all ride up on their horses and he's the guy in the giant helmet with the eight foot tall sword in front of him that you have to get, you have to ask very nicely to get past. You're just, you're, if, if you're thinking about his, his race at that, at that point, <laughs> you, you've got like bigger problems. <laughs> Um, and one thing I wanted to ask about, and I know this is sort of a pet issue of yours, um, is the question of what our superhero culture tells the rest of the world about America. Because American superhero movies are tremendously successful imports. Um, the Dark Knight, which presents a very grim image of a decaying <coughs> urban America that is deeply morally compromised by its fight against terrorism, uh, made hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars overseas. Um, Captain America, which was considered something of an international box office risk this summer, actually did quite well in an optimistic image of the United States killing a lot of clearly identified Nazi villains. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, what you think we say about the world to the world about ourselves in our superhero culture. That's a fine, fine question. You know that. There's always the question of how, how American are superheroes. There was a little backup story in a super, Superman comic published like eight months ago, in which uh, Superman said something about like, oh, you know, I just went to the UN today, and I'm telling them that I'm, I'm giving up my U.S. citizenship. I'm going to be a world citizen now. And you know, of course, like the punditocracy went. <gasps> What? Well, and he wasn't shows just that Superman's right. still relevant. And There's he wasn't no just giving up his citizenship, right. you know. Right. He Willing was giving right. up his citizenship to support peaceful democratic protesters in Iran. Right. So, uh, this story was never referred to again, and has now, thanks to the bizarre exigencies of superhero continuity in comic books, uh, it, it now retroactively never happened. Uh, <laughs> and yet, people completely freaked out about it. Six-page story. It, it's very, very strange to see this. And at the same time, you know, I've also been reading recently uh, the most popular superhero-type character in British comics ever is this character Judge Dredd, who's been around for like 35 years. There's a new story every week, and it's specifically a satire of American culture and American militarism. Uh, you know, the idea is that he's this you know, cop in a future American fascist police state. And the most popular Judge Dredd story ever is this one called America, in which uh, our you know, nominal hero crushes a democratic protest movement uh, and ends up like, shooting an immigrant woman named America in the back on the steps of the Statue of Liberty, which is towered over by a much bigger <laughs> Statue of Justice. And you know, his, uh, uh, the, the, fr the first line of narration in the story is him saying, like, justice has a price. The price is freedom. You know, this <laughs> This may be the world's image of what America is, and you know, we we can see this expressed through these mass entertainments. It's kind of a frightening thing. <laughs> the interesting thing, though, is that if you um, not to get into a discussion of box office grosses, but um, the Dark Knight, as much money as it made overseas, it actually made a higher percentage of its money here in the United States, whereas. A lot of the ones, you know, like Iron Man and uh, Iron Man and uh, I don't want to say Thor, but Captain America mm -hmm. and Spider Man in particular, that portray this very kind of optimistic, uh, optimistic side of the uh, kind of how America sees itself, right. do incredibly well overseas. So that might point towards, uh, you know, towards a lot of the world wanting to see the, uh, want it, wanting to see the, the positive side of American self-image, I'm not sure. And you did some international publicity for Thor and X-Men, right? I mean, I'd be curious what the reaction was by foreign um, journalists. They just wanted to, we had an international cast in Thor and all of the, the, the Japanese journalists just wanted to know, like, the the Japanese guy who played Hogan the Grim, like ha how, who's a huge star in Japan and has three lines in it. <laughs> they must find Thor. Um, you know, he said there was a tree. I, I, I remember all three of the lines, but uh, they just wanted to know about him. <laughs> you know, ev every country brings its own experience to things. That's funny. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to go back to Captain America for a second because I was really struck by the optimism of that movie. And it stood in stark contrast um, to me to this recent and very successful comics run that Marvel did called Civil War, um, where rather than being an uncomplicated avatar of American power, Captain America becomes a civil libertarian. He becomes the strongest opponent of a law that requires superheroes to register their powers with the United States government and be regulated by it. And he's ultimately murdered for it. Um, and it's an unsettling storyline. And I wonder if it speaks, and I'm really curious to what you all think about this, the sort of, are there larger audiences for more optimistic stories and more simplistic stories in superhero, in sort of superhero lore? And are stories like Civil War or um, Captain America, Red, White, and Black, which, as Tanazi mentioned, is essentially a fusing of the project that creates Captain America with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Those are you know, influential but smaller market comics. So I guess I'm wondering how, how big do we think the audience for these complex political superhero stories is? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I really, again, there's a, you can be deeply cynical, and I imagine a lot of people are deeply cynical and say simple always sells, simple's better, tell people what they want. And yet, you can always find examples of that not being true, you know. Um, I don't. Who knows? I mean, who knows what anybody? <laughs> we'd all be rich, right? I mean, if we, <laughs> if we really knew, we'd, we'd all go to Hollywood and be rich. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, don't you think there's? Um, I, I, did you read comics in the early late eighties and early nineties? I did. That's my era. Yeah. yeah I, I mean. It feels like a lot of the wrong lessons got drawn. From That's that. very true. Yes, <laughs> that, that that is definitely yeah. true. In terms of uh, you know a lot of the uh, the the great comics like Watchmen um, and the Dark Knight Returns um, and things like that from the late '80s and early '90s very much deconstructed a lot of the uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, the comic book mythology. But a lot of the lessons that were learned is that dark and gritty is uh, <laughs> right, is, what and wa is, is what people and is what people want, and and that led us to some kind of bad places. Yeah, there was a great interview with Alan Moore, who was the guy who wrote the original graphic novel Watchmen and a bunch of other stories that sort of affected the the course of superhero narratives for the next few years, saying like, I can't believe there's all these depressing stories just because I was in a bad mood one year. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, is that like uh, is I think. Uh, you know, and Alyssa might, you know, have something to say about this. But we just went through this sort of thing where they, you know, where we're going through this thing with there are all these 60s shows because of Mad Men. Um, can you guys tell I can't wait for Mad Men to come out? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, like, and you see, like, a similar thing again in hip hop. You know, Biggie says this, and Biggie's a great rapper, sounds, you know, sounds great doing that. And then everybody's suddenly doing it. None of them are any good, but, you know, they're great. sort of imitating the easiest things. To imitate, and I always wonder, is there some record exec, some movie exec, some publishers, get me something dark and gritty. Who doesn't really like understand <laughs> the depth of it, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've met most of them. Okay, <laughs> right. so those people do exist. Yeah, they, they do exist. It's, it's the, the, you know, Dark Knight was dark and gritty right. and was a big success, therefore, Dark and gritty works. Com yeah, therefore, all comic book adaptations <laughs> should be dark and gritty. When it's like nobody says Dark Knight was a beautifully made movie and was a big success. <laughs> Let's make some more beautifully made movies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what we need is movies with the cra attention to craft and detail. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, well, that is true. That sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although I, I will, you know, in Hollywood's defense for a second, there is a, a really kind of interesting phenomenon of taking unexpected and artier choices for directors and pairing them with these big superhero movies, right. whether it's, uh, you know, Kenneth Branagh doing, uh, doing Thor or, you know, Chris Nolan from Memento, and now they're talking to, uh, to Patty Jenkins, who did uh, Monster. Or the Charlize Theron movie um, to do Thor two, which I think could be really interesting because of, you know, it, it'd be interesting to get a kind of outsider's take on the m ultimate manly hero. Well, I'm I'm curious to see what Joss Whedon is going to do with the Avengers. Uh, Whedon is the creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, who I'm sure is familiar to many of you here. But he's also one of the great sort of feminist science fiction auteurs of the last 15 years, and. Um, I'll be curious to see what he does 
with masculinity in, in The Avengers, which is a movie that has mostly male characters, um, but who are sort of in the hands of a director who's very thoughtful about gender. And I don't, I don't know if you've heard anything about the direction of that movie, but I'm certainly very curious to sure. see what he does. Um, and one thing I thought, we haven't really discussed Iron Man, um, who is in many ways even more like directly salient to some of our current policy uh, dilemmas in The Dark Knight, mm -hmm. it's mostly metaphorical. Um, in the Iron Man movies are both sort of a break from the dark and gritty trend in that they're very funny. It's Robert Downey Jr. playing a playboy arms contractor who has a crisis of conscience and decides to save the people of Afghanistan. Um, <laughs> he's, you know, moderately successful. Um, but I, you know, I'm, since we haven't talked about that franchise very much, I'd be curious what all of you thought about it and sort of whether it represents an actual, you know, break in tone and in content. Uh, again, it represents a break, a break in well-madeness, like they're really <laughs> nicely made movies. But Iron Man is also a very interesting character because he, he is explicitly the military-industrial complex guy. Yeah, like he was the, the, the character was originally based on Howard Hughes, yeah. right? Uh, he, I mean, he's an <laughs> arms manufacturer, and he makes a giant sh suit of armor that can go out and shoot things. Like, that's, that's his role. And in fact, in Civil War, which was this big comics narrative that we were talking about a few minutes ago, he's the person who represents the side of like, no, we have to make it a security and surveillance state. We have to have information on all the superheroes. We have to get everybody to register, and we have to get everyone to work for the government. Um, and he, he's, you know, he's framed in that position. Captain America is framed opposite him as the civil libertarian. And of course, Iron Man ends up win it, winning, and uh, Captain America ends up dead. So. <laughs> dead. Dead, yeah. <laughs> dead. <laughs> well, as dead as anything gets it. Right. One of the Super benefits dead. of being a superhero is it's really, really hard to die. Uh. <laughs> well, it's easy to die, but it's really easy to, to come, come back. back. To yeah. <laughs> die permanently. They die, then they get better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and one question I wanted to ask you in particular, because we spent a lot of today talking about superheroes who are created by the two big core companies, right. Marvel and DC. And I'd be curious to see what you think the impact of independent comics has been on superhero stories and whether there are any, you know, are we, is there, are there trends we should be looking out for that are in the independent comic space that Marvel and DC are going to be smart enough to pick up on? Oh, independent comics have, have always been creator driven. Uh, they have generally fled from the idea of superhero comics just because there's this commercial monolith and that if you can operate in resistance to that, you're gonna operate in resistance to it. Uh, occasionally we see other people trying to do stuff in that kind of space, but if you can't fit into one of those two big master narratives, it makes it much, much harder to connect with an audience. Uh, occasionally we see things like, t you know, today there is a story about the 99 that was in uh, the Washington Post, uh, who are the team of superheroes from the world of Islam that were created by you know, this businessman who essentially like wanted himself written in as the Professor X type and has hired a whole bunch of people who were making comics 20 years ago to make comics about him and his team of superheroes. Um, and for some reason it hasn't caught on <laughs> here, uh, which has to do more than anything else with the fact that it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, do, do you have any comments on that? Or? I'm interested in the 99 because, I mean, I think it speaks to a larger right. problem of trying to break in new heroes right. and find audiences right. for right. them, period. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a sort of stasis there um, and a challenge to the larger goal of making superheroes more representative and right. really to tell different kinds of stories. That's tr true. And there, there has not been, mu you know, the canon of superhero characters, of superhero stories has been fairly stable for the last 35 years. You know, I'd, I'd say like the one big exception recently was the new Batwoman who's uh, you know, lesbian, gets don't ask, don't tell out of West Point, says, you know, I need to find a way to serve my community. Wait, I live in Gotham City and my parents were horribly murdered. I know what I'll do, I'll put on the Bat costume. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what one does. Uh, um, but ha has you know, in a lot of ways become a story about gay rights and about don't ask, don't tell. Um, and, th and it's made commercial inroads partly because it's beautifully done. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of new blood in that, in that department. Maybe you, you would argue with that. Right? 
No, I, 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 I think it goes towards uh, it, it goes towards what we were all saying earlier that that there is a kind of uh, conservatism and and a lot of the the kind of canon of characters are are really established, but that ultimately it's you know I think ultimately artistic quality is Great. what uh, artistic quality and just the the strange thing of some characters just reson some yeah. characters just resonate. I mean, I mean. I think to most of you out there, if you know the X-Men at all, you know the guy with the claws, <laughs> um, Wolverine, who was a fairly late introduction, who was a fa fairly late introduction, but became just unbelievably popular as a belligerent little hairy yeah. Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, belligerent or hairy, hairy Canadians need representation too, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Last oppressed minority. <laughs> 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 Small hairy Canadian <laughs> Canadians. <yes. laughs> well, before we open it up to questions, I wanted to sort of come full circle and ask, you know, all of us grew up reading superhero stories, watching superhero cartoons. What do superheroes mean to you now? I mean, I know you said you've backed away some in some of the same ways you have with hip hop. Yeah, but you know, you can't. There's a couple of things you can't actually back. I mean, you can as an active consumer, but if you look on my iPad right now, this certainly is the Marvel Comics app. Um, I don't know what it means that I mostly read stuff from when I was a kid, um, except that I'm getting old um, <laughs> and I want these kids off my lawn. Uh, but <laughs> beyond that, um, I think there's a, a, a much bigger issue, and that is how your aesthetic is shaped um, by uh, superhero comics and by, you know, I guess whatever influence you have as a young person. Um, one of the things that happened particularly with me is there were th these two things going on. I was reading comic books, and I was growing up at a, in a time where people thought in my community that African American history was going to have this sort of curative power, that we all had low self-esteem, and if we just you know, learned who was the first astronaut and the first black chemist and the first whoever, that that would somehow cure us, right? So there was this whole myth building going on in the African American community, even, even as I was consuming other myths, you know, from the broader popular culture. And now at 36, those things have kind of fused for me. So that like, you think about Sojourner Truth, right? Her name was like Isabel something or other. And then she, you know, got this vision and proclaimed herself Sojourner Truth or Harriet Tubman, you know, going and rescuing however many slaves they say to rescue. You think about this in a really, really adventurous way. And you, you can, you know, sort of see some of that in some of the novelists and right. other people from other experiences. But I don't think you can really get away from it. Um, it you know, it kind of gets in your bones, regrettably. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, just personally, I, I, I kind of resonate to superheroes on both the kind of political and personal level. It's, it's, it's this wonderful venue to, you know, superheroes are this wonderful venue to tell stories about what's happening in America now and what's happening in the world in a way that maybe people wouldn't respond to as much if not through the level of, if not for the layer of allegory. But it's also just on a personal level, I find the best superheroes really aspirational. And I know mm -hmm. that's, that's, that sounds kind of adolescent in some ways, but you know, on, on some, I think, I think everyone with a Batman tattoo or T-shirt on some level like aspires to that kind of force of will, that kind of Nietzschean force of will that Batman represents, or the kind of the you know the or who wears a Superman T-shirt, um, you know, aspiring towards that kind of evolved, benign you know kind of best of hum kind of best of humanity that uh, that Superman repre represents, and and I think there's. I, I don't think you can discount the personal and 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 the idea that maybe they can, maybe superheroes can teach us teach us to live our own lives more heroically and boldly. I'm absolutely with you there. I agree completely about that. Uh, and you know, th these are really colorful, vivid stories that you know. I've been reading them for most of my life. They've st they've stuck in my head. They've become. A reference point for the way I think about things, just in it, personally and politically, uh, and one can't necessarily, you know, leap tall buildings in a single bound. But you can think about what's possible, what's possible within one's own capabilities. I love that. Well, and I think, I mean, one of the things that's been meaningful for me is this idea of service. That 
you know, it's, yes, Superman may have a boss, but he also has a job that lets him get into the city, that lets him identify problems. And there's this, you know, I think we live in a time when it's very easy to be consumed simply with the struggle to level that playing field, to stay afloat, to pay the rent. And I think superheroes speak to the thing that if we all had a certain amount of security or capacity, we would really love to be able to be. And I think it's striking that that myth you know, that myth is repeatedly about service and about trying to do good, and yes, about the, the bad things that can happen along the way, but it, it is, superheroism is an optimistic idea, and I think that especially in unoptimistic times, that is powerful. I think that's very powerful. Yeah, I, th I think it's no coincidence that nearly every superhero origin story is on some level, it's the character gets power, and the first part of it, they use it very self-indulgently. And the arc is learning, you know, as, as big of a cliche as it is, with great power comes great responsibility. And, yeah, entering into service. That, that's what it is. Well, let's open up the floor to some questions. I'm sure almost everyone here has seen a superhero movie and has, <laughs> has their favorites and some pressing concerns. Hi, uh, Chris Cormier with Gila Action and Gill Foundation. Um, thank you for putting this on. I actually was most excited about this part of the conference with all due respect to Secretary Clinton. Um, I, so I, I grew up reading comic books, X-Men, Nightcrawler was my guy. Um, a just curious, show of hands, who grew up reading comic books or watching Wonder Woman or something? Just raise your hand if you did. Yeah, so pretty much all of us. And I'm sure Secretary Clinton would raise her hand too if she were here. Um, you know, a lot of the people in this room are trying to solve big problems. And we go to work every day and we maybe even envision that we are the superheroes you've just described and sort of because your jobs are to think um, in a way that is uh, these characters solving these big problems and addressing these issues, sort of curious to see what your advice is uh, for everybody here. I'm sure, you know, why CAP has you here is to have us do exactly that, to sort of think outside of our daily problems and lives and think bigger about it. So just curious to hear what your advice is. I mean, that's a really interesting question. And again, I thought sort of Bill's presentation this morning about the importance of poetry and narrative um, is critically important. It's, you know, it's very difficult to tell people to do something just because it's good or just because it's right. And I think that providing narratives that can make people feel I think, it's, I think it's a matter of two things. Um, you know, I, I think it's very important in political organizing and in my experience doing political work in giving people tasks that make them feel as if they're actually making a difference. Um, you know, it's one thing to, you know, to take a very simple example, it's one thing to ask people to buy some clothes or some toys for a Salvation Army drive. It's a very different thing to get someone into a soup kitchen and actually having contact with the people that they're helping. So I think finding tasks that make people feel as if they're having, where they can see the impact that they're having, as opposed to simply writing a check. Not that we don't like people to write checks, checks are good. Um, but to give people a sort of impactful task, and then to build a narrative around it to actually connect them to a story. And there will be different stories in different cases. Um, but sort of providing reference points and you know, not being afraid to tell people that they're doing something big um, and sort of trusting that people will rise to the challenge, I think is sort of the, the best thing I can think of to do. But I think you need both parts of that equation. We have Mike over here for our fearless leader. Uh, John Podesta. Uh, I, uh, almost all of you have touched on a sort of uh, moral arc that runs through all these superhero stories. Uh, whether it's just all good in Superman or, or the struggle for good and bad in The Dark Knight or the narrative arc that y you just mentioned. Um, I want to compare and contrast question. If you think about video games, I kind of think not so much. Uh, and I wonder whether you think that the people who uh, are actually the creators of video games have a sensibility about justice and that kind of moral arc that infuses those games. And they're the things that are at least as much uh, uh, acting as the popular culture mm. uh, for young people today. 
I mean, I I think video games are kind of all over the map. I, mm -hmm. I in a way that uh, in a way that movies are not. And I think on one hand you have the video games where you can indulge your inner sociopath, um, <laughs> for good or ill. And then, but then you also have uh, you you actually do have really interesting video games like say the Bioshock franchise that is all about morality right. and all about the consequences of um, you, different things happen to your character based on whether you take the expedient choice that's morally dubious or the more difficult choice that's uh, that's better that that's uh, that's better morally. So I think. Video games have the potential to do to do what you're talking about, but it, you again, it's the the spectrum from from positive to, you know, I'm gonna beat up hookers and uh, <laughs> drive a car real fast. I, I, I would add that that there are two limiting factors for the kinds of narratives that video games can tell. One of them is technology. Um, and that's, you know, the technology keeps getting better and better, but maybe the more important one is that they demand constant first person involvement from the person playing them who always needs to be doing something exciting. Like they can't have sort of long periods of downtime where you're you know, getting lots of information and wrestling with moral issues. Uh, you have to be able to like, do something with the controller. And that, that, that is a limit on the kinds of stories that uh, video games can tell. I think it's also important to recognize that in comic books, people do beat up hookers and do you know, pretty <laughs> awful and yeah. wretched, wretched things. But that's I, the women in refrigerators. Right, that's the women in refrigerators. Um, but on top of that, you know, just piggybacking off of Zach's point that video games are all over the place, there's also this you know, booming franchise of online, uh, massively... Uh, I, I'm gonna massively multiplayer online. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> like World of Warcraft. Forms. <laughs> where people actually have to deal with like real morality because they're forming organizations, they're working together, they're doing different things. So they there's actual like it's not even it really isn't virtual. I mean it's really, you know, people form friendships and they have to decide how to treat people and groups get reputations and all the things that you see, all the sort of moral qualms that you see duplicated uh, that we see in our real world are in turn duplicated online. So, like attacking um, funerals. Like attacking funerals, which is another story that we'll go into another time. But yeah, <laughs> that's a great one. That really is a great yeah. one. Yeah. I don't know. We'll, 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 very, very brief aside, they, they actually did a memorial, one of these games, I think it was Warcraft. It was Warcraft. They did a the memorial died service in real life. online for someone who had died in real life. And a bunch of people decided it would be fun to attack it. And, and video and tape and video and, and video put it video. online. Yeah, everywhere and, so and everyone could see it. You can find it on YouTube. So yeah, there you go. But it was interesting because there was this big moral debate about was that right? Have you violated something? What is that? I mean, yeah. I think most of us think it was pretty indecent, but I mean, there, there was this whole moral question there, definitely. Well, I'm actually really glad you asked that because I would recommend that everyone in the room who's thinking about how to more effectively engage constituents or build stronger organizations go out and get a book by. Um, a game theorist called Jane McGonigal, uh, and the book is called Reality is Broken. And it's based on the idea that video games are providing forms of happiness that we've gotten very bad at providing mm. in real life. Mm. Um, she argues for these principles called Flow and Fiero that are about giving people work that is genuinely hard to do, but that is achievable and is rewarding when they achieve it. And I think that's something that political organizations and progressive organizations can do tremendously well. Uh, we can give people hard work and we can engage them. The thing that's interesting about video games is that they produce these very high levels of engagement. Um, in the series of Halo games, um, players have killed 10 billion enemy characters. That's a large number. It's totally meaningless, I mean, but people feel this sense of community and accomplishment and McGonagall argues, I think, really effectively that if we can find ways to tap in to the same impulses as video games, we can change our world for the better. Um, I don't necessarily think that means that video games are heroic, but I think that the reward systems and the idea of not, you know, I think there's, a, I think there's an impulse in politics <sighs> to make things easy. You can just click this button. You can sign this petition online. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything hard. And McGonagall argues in a way that I think is salient for all of us here that what people want is work. And they want to struggle and to learn and to contribute to something. And so 
I think you can learn a lot from video games in their form, if not their content. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you walk so much. <laughs> Hey, uh, Ian Milheiser. Um, one of the iconic images of late 2008 and early 2009 was the Obama picture where he's opening up his shirt and he has a big Superman O. Um, and it captured you know, how many people viewed the man. Um, you know, he was then perceived as the most, one of the most talented people, if not the most talented member of his generation. You know, we thought he was going to sweep in and be our superhero. And two years later, he's still the same dude. And I still believe that he is the most talented member of his generation. And yet, um, you know, it turns out the filibuster is his kryptonite. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I look at the superhero genre, you know, one of the reasons why, um, one of the reasons why Watchmen is such an effective critique is because it ends with a superhero who, had, who literally has the powers of God being unable to stop the greatest act of genocide in world history. And that's something that is rare that you see that kind of powerlessness. But that powerlessness is very real in our world today. My question is, you know, do, is that a way where the genre reflects a blindness mm. of, the, uh, of the American people? Where, you, you know, while we have a Senate that is unable to function, 70% of the country still believes that we have the greatest government in the world, system of government in the world. You know, is the fact that our superheroes always win a reflection of a blindness in American society? Mm. Well, one, one of the things that always bothered me is, um, well, I'll say two things. The first thing is, as a young person, one of the most attractive things about Spider-Man was that everybody hated him, that he would get booed and he had bad press and he was presumably the hero, but no one actually in New York felt that way about Spider-Man. I think there's some reflection on how heroism often happens in real life, that people aren't really happy with people who history later judges to be uh, heroic. The second question for me is what the audience is for serious stories that would reflect the sort of thing that you're talking about. So again, one of the iconic events in Spider-Man's history is his girlfriend, who's his true love, gets killed. Um, but there have been all these attempts to bring her back. And I keep thinking, we should have to wrestle with the fact that what was supposed to happen did not happen. That something awful actually happened. Right. And that there was a triumph of great evil, and there's nothing he can do to fix that. Right. Like, we should have to fight with that. And part of what's interesting about that story is there's a question of whether Spider-Man is culpable. Cul right. His right. enemy right. throws his girlfriend off a bridge, he catches her in, her in his webs, it turns out her neck is broken, and the question is whether it's by the fall or by the shock of him catching her. And so I think that is an interesting. And, and this is the, uh, the movie, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 love, the love interest is gonna be the movie this summer, and I keep wondering, are they going to kill her? I know that's an awful thing to think about it, but do they have the actual nerve to deal with the import of what that would mean? I forgot that they actually, like, took physics into account yes. for, for <laughs> once in comic books. <laughs> Anyone remember the Superman movie where, where she falls in the, that she's falling in the helicopter and he's going <laughs> up? Yeah. And it's like. <laughs> <laughs> physics doesn't always work the way we think it does in comic book world. To, to your point though, I would say that one of the things about superhero stories is they don't always win. What, what we expect from them, what we see from them is that they keep pushing and they keep fighting, but they lose and they lose and they lose and they lose. Uh, you know, even talk, going back to like the sort of central superhero narrative of the last couple of years, The Dark Knight, and that's a flat out loss in a lot of ways at the, right. end, at the end of the story, but the point of it is that he keeps going. Yeah, it, 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 I, I think that's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. I, think, I think the more mature superhero titles do that and, it's, and, and it isn't, you know, being a superhero I would think isn't about always winning, it's about never giving up and having that kind of indomitable spirit and I, I think that's, that's what attracts people, uh, that spirit is what attracts people at least as much as the idea that, you know, on some level Iron, uh, Iron Man was, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could go into Afghanistan and just zap all of the bad guys without getting any of the civilians and <laughs> everyone will love us. So that logo might have been more true than, you know, we, we know. It, I think it has a lot more to do with our impressions of what superheroes are, you know.
Julian? So um, I'm just wondering if you touched on the ground a little bit. Um, I mean, uh, right, I mean, so I sort of want to believe in this sort of positive aspirational aspect of superheroism, but it seems like, um, right, the, it's not just the Dark Knight, but basically every superhero story, at least within the two main continuities, right, like requires the same story over and over again, which is there is some huge problem that is in, in the face of which like diplomacy and, and ordinary democratic accountable institutions, the police, are completely impotent. And the only way basically that this can be solved is for someone acting totally unaccountably, you know, in secret to, with a mask, to deploy, like, to deploy a capacity for extraordinary physical violence, um, <laughs> and that you know, with a, a couple exceptions here and there, for this to basically always work and always to be deployed benignly by someone who, you know, again, consistently and again, and again, as long as you've got the right person, as long as it's the hero and not the individual right. personal villain, um, this unaccountable power is is on net always a force for good. Um, it's a totally diluted it, fantasy. It, it, <laughs> worries me a little that the sort of crossover into sort of total mainstream dominance of the superhero genre has occurred over the last 10 years where, you know, you might describe some of those things as being, you know, relevant in other ways. I mean, I wonder, is that like a toxic kind of image for, or, or well, narrative to be reabsorbing? It's interesting that you say that because we, we've alluded to the, at least in comic books, the whole Civil War storyline and the assumption of a lot of people, and really a lot of the writers too, was that of course the Captain America civil libertarian side was, was the right one. But at its best, the, in the main continuity, they raised some very provocative questions like, shouldn't people who are walking around with the power of gods have some kind of accountability right. other right. than what their, other than their, really other than their own? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's when, when we were, uh, I had a very smart executive on, uh, on X-Men First Class and a couple other things that I'm not allowed to talk about, but he always talked about, um, you know, like what would this look like in the real world? It's like, it's like I if this is the equivalent of a guy walking down the street with a rocket launcher, shouldn't right. the police have something to say about that? Shouldn't there be some kind of democratic channels? So, so the, th there actually was a very good argument in the Civil War continuity for the, for the idea that maybe if you have these kinds of powers, you, you need to register and, and be accountable to the state or and the people. Yeah, and in fact, that was, uh, Civil War was followed by the whole like Dark Reign thing, which it, the storyline that took over one of the two big master narratives for a good year or so, which was entirely about like what happens when genuinely awful people find themselves appointed to positions of power. What, what the consequences are for, from like, you know, assuming legitimacy. Yeah, but I, I, I think there is a place, and I would like to see that in, in, in the movies as well uh, for a little, bit more, yeah. a little bit more skepticism, which I think you could argue the Dark Knight has a little bit, a, a little bit of that. The whole, the whole narrative arc of the Dark Knight is Batman is trying to make himself irrelevant by building up law and order right. in the in the case in the form of Harvey Dent, and it just it just goes disastrously wrong. More questions? Well, thank you so much for your time. It was <laughs>